My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC ECHO. Welcome to this week's session, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. So we'll dive right in. So first of all, I want to let you know that um, in addition to these drugs being approved, but there, there are new revised ASLD IDSA guidelines. Those were updated in late September, and they do cover um, these new medications and also some, some new information on uh, antiviral resistance as well as HIV. So this is what was um, kind of cold from those, those uh, paragraphs. And, and when they talk about Vosevi, which is Sofosbuvir, Velpatosvir, and Voxilaprevir, I think it's really important for this crowd to know that it was not actually formally studied. Um, so we're really extrapolating from the, the HIV negative population. And we, we've really seen that that's not much of an issue um, in terms of efficacy. It's a little bit more of an issue from from uh, drug drug interactions. Now, glucopreprevir pembrentosphere or Maveret has been formally uh, studied in, in, an, in a nice uh, phase three study of almost 140 patients, and it did have an, a variety of patients and it had a, a good SVR. So, my in, take on these two drugs is that I'm really reserving uh, Sofelvox or Vosevi for salvage regimen. These are people who have failed um, our second generation DAAs. Whereas I'm using uh, GP or Maveret more as an initial treatment, it is indicated for retreatment, but that just kind of give you my take on those two, two medications and how I, I view them. So let's dive into what's now approved by the FDA. It's getting a longer and longer list. So many of you know about Harvoni. Just to remind folks, it's not pangenotypic. Um, so you, you miss your twos and threes. Vicuropac, which is the three drug regimen and in includes ritonavir, is made by AbbVie, and I really anticipate that that's not gonna be supported, and you're not gonna see that on formularies, and you're not gonna see that used as much, primarily because of the drug-drug interactions and high pill burden, and also you need to use ribavirin. Uh, Maverick, we're gonna talk about, and the key thing I really wanted to draw your attention to here, which was a, a kind of a game changer, is the cost, 26,000. So it was at least half of what the uh, next cheapest drug was, Zepatir, and that's really made a, a profound impact on access. I know in, in uh, Alaska that that was a, a key, a key a decision for opening up who can be treated in Alaska state, so now um, I think all fibrosis levels are, are open to treatment there, so we're going to talk about that. The De, cladosphere, um, again, I don't think is going to be used as much because it's, uh, you know, have an additional cost and, and you, you don't really have much of an advantage over Maverick or Softvel. And uh, Zepatir is a, a good drug for in -stage renal disease, but you de do need to do this additional testing. So a little bit more groundwork for you. Uh, Epcluza is pangenotypic uh, and Softvel box, we'll, we'll talk about that primarily for a uh, salvage regimen. So I don't know about you guys, you probably, uh, in HIV, you're now over 30 medications, but sometimes I feel like, gosh, uh, there's so many different medicines and you know, your brain's starting to get a little full here. So maybe you guys are less sympathetic than us uh, simplistic liver docs. <laughs> Let's talk about Softel Vox. So uh, this drug is one pill, so single, single tablet regimen, but they cram three antivirals in there and made by Gilead, they know how to do this. So two of them you, you probably are, are familiar with, the Sofosbuvir velpatosphere, that's Epclusa, and you've got a polymerase inhibitor there plus an NS5A inhibitor. What they did is they added a third drug, a proteus inhibitor, called voxilaprevir, and it's a potent antiviral. It gets all genotypes. So you basically now have one pill that gets all six genotypes. And so uh, we're going to talk about the Polaris studies, uh, Polaris 1 and 4. These were published in the New England Journal of Medicine this summer. The Polaris 1 study was a, a pretty large placebo-controlled randomized clinical trial that was looking at Sofelvox in people who've already been treated with NS5A inhibitors and failed. It was a uh, international study and they basically included cirrhotics and, and non-cirrhotics. So it was a placebo-controlled trial, pretty straightforward with a 12-week regimen or, or getting placebo. And it was a two to one randomization, so more people got the, the uh, investigational drug versus placebo. Just to give you an idea of what were the prior NS5As that were used, uh, it was mostly Harvoni. So most of these were uh, Lodiposphere failures, 51%, uh, and then the next most common NS5A that uh, was used was Declanosphere and a little bit of the Vicuropac and a couple of these other maybe investigational drugs that didn't uh, quite make it to FDA approval. So, um, 
I wanted to first talk about side effects and just to let you know that they're pretty similar side effects, maybe a little bit more headache in the soft Vox group. Fatigue is about the same, but the thing that definitely is shaking out is more diarrhea. Uh, it's anywhere from five to 10% more common than Apclusa or with placebo. And we know this about proteus inhibitors, hep C proteus inhibitors, that they can cause diarrhea. Some of you may remember telaprevir, and, and we used to call it firea. It was a really burning, toxic diarrhea. It's not that. It's just, just the kind of you know loose bowel movements, um, kind of irritating, and you can treat it with uh, you know, your usual anti-diarrheals. But uh, just, so, just so you know, you want to counsel your patients, they might have a little bit more diarrhea than, than normal. So let's uh, go then to the... SVR 12, and uh, the overall um, SVR for these um, patients was, was uh, 90, 96%. And you see there's a little bit of a, a trend, maybe in our genotype 4, it's kind of small sample size here where they had 91% cure. But they people who are 1Bs, 2s, not a whole lot of 5s and 6s, but they all did well. And uh, this was an intention to treat analysis, so about half those people who were considered failure were either lost to follow up or they withdrew their consent. And there's a very small percentage of people who actually had true virologic failure. So, next, I, I wanted to talk about the uh, Polaris 4 study. So, we talked about the NS5A failures, but this one was looking at um, patients who had uh, treatment with other regimens, other DAs, but not NS5As. So, uh, kind of the flip side of what we just looked at. So most of these were sulfosporivir failures. A couple were SimSaw failures. Um, I think the other category is probably Vicuripac. I'm sorry, it wouldn't be Vicuripac. It would be like Technivi. And the overall cure rate was 97%. It outperforms uh, sulfosporivir or Velpatosphere or Apclusa. And in particular, it did very well in 1As and 3As. That was where the major separation between these two drugs was in, in those two uh, genotypes categories. So let's talk about drug-drug interactions with Vosevi and ARV. So just to start out with that, voxilaprevir is a substrate for the OATP and the P-glycoprotein, the uh, breast cancer receptors, and then CYP3A and CYP1A uh, 2C8. So the big thing to know is you cannot use this with adazanib or ritonavir. And if you were going to uh, use this with TAF, m tricytamine and Elvitegravir, and Cobicistat, the voxilaprevir levels go up. So you might see a little bit more diarrhea. You just need to watch out for that. Plus, if you've got a patient who's maybe a cirrhotic or uh, pre-cirrhotic, the PI in Vosevi, the voxilaprevir, can, can cause worsening of the liver function. So you might want to watch those people a little bit more closely. There is also a slight interaction between tenofovir, tenofovir, the TDF form of that, and uh, so you just want to watch for renal toxicity and also uh, the darunavir, ritonavir. It's not an absolute contraindication like adazanavir. You just want to kind of maybe follow LFTs every four weeks in those situations. You know, like, like what we did with tenofovir, valpatasvir, you want to follow the creatinine, phosphate, and UA if you're using a tenofovir, a, the TDF version. But the ones that were test that we um, have a little bit of preliminary data on and that look really clean are the uh, integrase inhibitors. So dolutegravir, raltegravir, amtricitabine looks clean, and rilpivirine. I uh, also want to let you know that efavirenz is not recommended because it interacts with the valpatasvir part of, of the uh, three-drug regimen. So next I'm going to talk about glucoprepivir pembrentisvir, or Mavret. This is a single-dose tablet kind of analogous to Zepatir in that it's got a protease inhibitor and a NS5A inhibitor. And I think there are a couple of uh, key um, advantages to this drug, and it, it really goes to the, the pembrentosphere side of things. And, and the first is that it's very potent against this Y93H mutation. And just to give you an analogy, the Y93H mutation is kind of like the K103 for your NNRTIs. It, it really can knock out the efficacy. And this is kind of like the rilpivirine or, or etrovirine. It, it can uh, get quite a bit of activity against that particular mutation. The other thing that I really like about this regimen is that it is not metabolized by the kidney. So you can use in patients who have um, renal disease, including the folks who are on uh, hemodialysis. The third thing that I, I like about it is it doesn't have a, such a strict restriction on uh, drugs that uh, block acid metabolism, so that your PPIs 
and your H2 inhibitors. Um, that has come up quite a bit with Epclusa and Harvoni. So let's talk about the uh, indications here uh, that are on the FDA. Um, if you have a HCV uh, chronically infected patient, including with HIV, and there's no cirrhotic, and they're treatment naive, you can go with eight weeks on all genotypes. So that's a, a big advantage over um, Epclusa and even over Harvoni. There's all these little stipulations with using Harvoni for eight weeks. This is much more straightforward. If you have a cirrhotic, who, even if they're treatment naive, you do need to go longer to 12 weeks. So then um, it, uh, you can use this in treatment uh, failure patients. As you can see, this grid gets a little bit more complicated, and, I, and I'll just let you know that if you look at the ASLD guidelines, the, the strength of recommendation is, is not 1A like it is with Osevi. It's more like 2A or 2B, just because the, the sample size was much smaller. So um, that's part of the reason why I, I don't um, think about this as a re uh, regimen for prior failures. But you can see that in the most part, we're using this for 12 to 16 weeks, um, with the, the main exception of if anyone has failed um, uh, PEG, RIBA, uh, and um, uh, plus minus the sofosbuvir. There are some cases where you can use eight, eight weeks. So I'm going to talk about the Expedition 2 study, which was a phase three study in HIV-infected patients. Uh, they were randomized to either get eight weeks or 12 weeks um, of therapy. Um, and uh, sorry, it was not randomization. They, they um, included uh, the non serotic folks for eight weeks and serotic patients were for 12 weeks. So this was uh, just per the package inserts. So you can kind of see who these patients were. Um, the treatment experience patients were approximately uh, 15 to 20 percent, with a lot of them being interferon failures. They just had uh, three patients who had failed a sofosbuvir based regimen. There was quite a number of people who had uh, a fairly recent history of injection drug use or on opioid replacement therapy, so pretty uh, typical, maybe what we're seeing in our own practice. Uh, most of the patients were on a TDF back, uh, backbone with about uh, 20 to 30 percent on a back of ear. And then if you look at their ARVs, a lot of them were on the integrase inhibitors uh, with a, a scattering of the ribopilferin, and just one patient was on the l or Kobe system. Uh, good uh, CD4 counts for most of these patients. So then if you look at the um, overall SVR, it was excellent. Um, the intention to treat analysis was 98%. There were three patients who failed. And then if you look at that, there was only one true uh, failure, one virologic breakthrough. Uh, one patient stopped before they even got to a month, and another one was lost to follow-up. So really, if you looked at the true mod um, failure rate, the mod modified intention to treat analysis, it was 150 out of 151 who went on to get a um, treatment success. So what about the drug interactions? Um, similar to what we saw with uh, Valpatasir, you, you really cannot use with Afavirenz, uh, and you really should stay away from ritonavir-boosted PIs. Uh, we don't have a lot of data for uh, Elvitegri or Cobicistat with just that one patient, and they did notice that the LFT levels did bump a little bit, but uh, they went right back down. So I think the recommendation is that you'd follow LFTs uh, monthly if you... I uh, needed to stick out the l copy cystat regimen. So in, in conclusion then, Sofosfor, uh, Valpatasir, Voxilaprid, or Vosevi, in my opinion, is probably the best option for Sofosfor and NS5A failures, primarily just for the, the robustness of the data, much more sample size. And, and also I think just intrinsically three drugs is better than two in my, in my mind. Uh, just you need to check with your pharmacist before starting. Just make sure there's not any drug-drug interactions and warn your patients about the di diarrhea. I think GP is a really good uh, option for your treatment-naive patients, uh, anyone who's got end-stage renal disease or if, if they really can't get off um, a higher dose PPI. Just to be aware, don't use your PIs and efavirenz for that. Uh, and the last thing is that all these drugs, both GP and Vos and uh, Sofelvox. You do not want to use in anyone who has class B cirrhosis or beyond, just because that hep C protease can really um, make them spin out of control and lead to decompensation. So please make sure you know um, how they're doing with their cirrhosis before starting therapy.